Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to A Gathering Place. And today we're bringing my longtime friend, Damon Fordham, on. We're going to talk about Black South, South Carolina Black political history, Black history, and a couple of books. One he already has out, one that's getting ready to come out, and just the impact. And it's just fascinating stuff. I am happy to bring him on. So if you're ready, to get ready to learn more about South Carolina Black history and political, and in particular political history, this is the show for you. I'll see you in a minute. Hello, I'm Marilyn Hemingway, and welcome to a gathering place. I said I'm stepping back because we have young voices who want to be heard, and they're moving on something. Brandon is really important to you and your business. Even a basic type of technology. You learn it all. Good question. So I'm back, folks, so let's jump right on in it. We know folks have been excited about Damon Fordham coming on. And if you have your questions and comments ready, of course, you know, drop them in the comment section and we'll get to as many questions as we can for the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, first, let's go ahead and bring on Damon Fordham, author, historian, professor, and friend. <laughs> yes. Go back to the days of the University of South Carolina, as a matter of Yes. Way. That's very true. Back in the day. And that's some some stuff going on history wise also at USC and black folks. But, um, you know, all of that kind of touches on what we're going to touch on today with black history. Damon, always good to have you on. I'm excited. We've been trying to get you on for a while, but your, your schedule is getting busier and busier. You're, you're getting in demand because of your research and your books and everything. I'm glad to see that. Well, I'm glad to see it, too, because not only does it help me financially, but I think that a lot of things that I touch on are helpful in helping people to understand that a lot of what they're told was not correct and a lot of the things that limited their horizons did not have to be. So, I, so I'm so i especially happy to give that kind of information out to the general public, things that are useful. Very good. I'm glad you mentioned that the correction of history we know one of the big uh, controversies now and it's really not controversial is critical race theory where in my opinion and i have to state it's my opinion because mm -hmm. i'm not an academic nor a researcher is that you know people are now researching the whole history learning mm -hmm. the truth of history rather than the myth that was um told to us has history and that upset some people you know i kind of think about it as they, they it's kind of like when you find out your parents are real real human beings <laughs> and, and that's the same analogy i used yeah it's hurtful because it's like you know it's, it's like fans find out santa claus ain't real you That's know, true. literally true. It's true. And it's, you find out your parents and your grandparents are flawed human beings. And that's a hurtful thing. Now, I'm not saying that with a great deal of sympathy because of the myths and the lies that were told. People were really hurt and mm -hmm. actually killed because a lot of the lies that were told in our schools and in our homes. And when I say our, the collective of America. You know, not all of us, some of us had to live with the truth to stay alive. So, uh, so I'm kind of glad you mentioned that. We could go into that a little bit because I think we're going to talk about some political sure. folks. And it is it is political. But one of the questions I do want to ask you, just to give, give folks some background, what was your spark that got you interested in history? What led you down the path that you're on now to study history and, and express the truth of history, the full picture? Two things, wise storytelling elders and a love of reading. You see, I was fortunate enough to be raised by parents who were old enough to be my grandparents. And they were of that generation in which they got their information through the storytelling of their elders. And so I grew up listening to a lot of that. Now, a lot of kids didn't get that because 
a lot of times when elders told stories among themselves, they would tell the children to get lost. But uh, Do Reverend Dr. William Barber, one of the great, few, few great leaders of our time, said in uh, his book, The Third Reconstruction of How, he did the same thing with his parents as a boy. And when his, when his parents' friends would dismiss him, his father would say, let him stay, he's learning. And that's how my father and mother were with me. They would tell me family stories and things that they experienced through the Great Depression, World War II and civil rights and such. And then because I love to read, I would read a lot of things, especially Ebony Magazine in those days had a grand historian named Lerone Bennett who would write these fascinating stories about Marcus Garvey and Jack Johnson and the Buffalo Soldiers and Booker T. Washington and all that. And I soaked up stuff up like a sponge. So you can say that that's an example of how representation matters. Mm -hmm. But all of those things got me into history. But then I didn't realize that I could make a living from this until when you and I were at the University of South Carolina, there was Dean Willie Harford yep. who explained to me how I could make a living from this. And it just basically went from there. Very good. I'm glad to hear that. And and you know something, shout out to Dean Harford who left us about two years ago, but he influenced so many of us at the University of South Carolina. So that's glad to hear his influence with you. I'm not surprised about that either. And of course, you know, I'm all into the reading. <laughs> Exactly. I love reading. You know, I was blessed to have a mother has a library and a mother and a father who believed in education. So I totally get you. And with me, my journey to appreciate more of our history, who we are, it's not only because I was raised in a family of academics, but my mother and I, Roots, the original miniseries Roots. <laughs> You know, the original, I remember boo-hoo in, in my mother's arms at the end of Roots. And why did they treat those people that way? I think that really started hit me about the peculiar institution of slavery. You know, I was, it, it just really hit me that I just remember boo in my mother's arms. And I became the family member, the genealogist, the one who started gathering that information. And then from there, it, it just grew, that love of reading and just wanting that knowledge. And um, the more I read beyond just what they gave me in school, the more I learned. And um, I, I, so I'm not a historian, but I certainly appreciate the history. And just going on trips with my mother, she loved to pull off on the side of the road. She loved to visit, visit cemeteries mm -hmm. and she loved to visit those just odd attractions, local attractions, local museums that that you kind of pass by, you know, you're on the interstate you don't think of. And that just gave me an appreciation of history. And it just kind of bloomed from there. So it's good to hear your story. So tell us, um, you've been researching recently um, Six Brave Brothers. I loved how you put that. And your tentative title is Call Us Aliens. And that's going to be released soon. But give us the background on this book, what it's about. Um, and, and I'm going to tell everybody, y'all need to go buy this book. If you're into South Carolina history, you need to go buy this book that's going to be coming out soon. But tell us about this book. The background of it is that in 1895, Benjamin Ryan Tillman, whose statue is still on the State House grounds, I might add, mm -hmm. Benjamin Ryan Tillman was the senator of South Carolina. And See, South Carolina was not segregated from day one. You had the Reconstruction period, which we're going to discuss a little bit later in this discussion. But uh, in 1895, he took the state's constitution and basically made segregation the law of the state, you see. And many people don't know and really believe that there was no resistance to that whatsoever. But there were these six brave African-American men, uh, there were six brave African American leaders. Uh, there were there was Robert Anderson from your hometown of Georgetown, South Carolina. I might add, Thomas Miller of Buford and Charleston, the great Robert Smalls of Buford, the same Robert Smalls who freed his own himself and his family from slavery, uh, William J. Whipper, an ancestor of Magistrate Seth Whipper, uh, Isaiah Reed of Buford, and James Wig of Buford. These bold African Americans went to the state house and confronted Benjamin Tillman and the South Carolina legislature 
how, why segregation was so wrong and evil to do to a people who did all they could to support this country as well as state. And essentially, I read Thomas Miller's speech, Call Us Aliens or Call Us Citizens, in a mm. book called, in a book called um, Lift Every Voice, African American Oratory. And I was so moved and inspired by this that I thought that, and I went, I dug, dug from the old newspapers of that period, the old uh, Columbia State and the Charleston News and Courier, where I found all the wonderful things that these men said at that convention that speak to us today. And I was so inspired. I said, people need to know about this. And so that's why I, put the, I wrote the book. Yeah, because people don't know about them. I knew about Robert Anderson being from Georgetown, and plus he married into my family. So, <laughs> so you know, um, I know about that. But to know about their impact and the fact that they put, they literally were putting their lives on the line. In they were. Confronting those folks, confronting Benjamin Tillman, who was known as Pitchfork Tillman, who bragged about shooting black people shooting them dead, you know, bragged about it and had suffered no consequences to have someone want to tell their story. That's tremendous. And why do you think we need to hear their story beyond what they did? What would be the impact? Well, as a matter of fact, Marilyn, it was you who I think gave the best answer to that question that I uh, put at the very end of the book where, let's see, I interviewed you on uh, December the 27th of last year, and you said these words, which are gonna be in the book, by the way, hopefully if the editors don't take it out. It said that, you said that, it makes me very proud as you were reading this, it reminds me of our family history and civic involvement in Georgetown and Horry County, and maybe it's just in our DNA, uh, but it's tragic that society has hidden this from us, because imagine the reaction of children learning that a local hero stood up to Tillman it would give them the courage to stand up to what they face today. And with the current situation of attempts at disfranchisement throughout the country, as we speak, I think that your words quite eloquently speak to why this is necessary. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I still believe that. I really <laughs> do. But, you I know, I think Malcolm X probably said it best when he said a speech in a speech in Los Angeles back in uh, 1962, that you cannot do anything if you believe that you haven't done anything. And people who grow up in educated homes where you have books and such and parents who know the history and all, these are things that we take for granted, that we did great things. But if you did not grow up in that kind of home, and a lot of our young people today didn't, especially since the days of the crack onslaught and mass incarceration, they didn't, they grew up with nothing but negativity said in their homes. And so that affects them, needless to say, what you, with the average person, what you see is what you know, and what you know is what you have been told. And if you're surrounded by negativity, that is going to just destroy your spirit and you as a person. So if you don't have any interference in that type of thing, you will definitely be doomed because there was a lady named Azalea Johnson out of Abbeville, South Carolina who in 1961 wrote these words, that children who do not read grow up with minds shackled to the babbling of others. Mm. We have to prevent that. Ooh, that's powerful. I love, well, you know I love words, but the, that's true. It's very, mm. it is very eloquently said, you know, the babble of others is so true. And when you talk about now, you can get biblical when you talk of the Tower of Babel and everything, but that's a whole nother show. But it, <laughs> Well, I mean, it also speaks to what it says in Proverbs about as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that ties in it with also. Which then leads us towards saying this is why as adults, we have to be very careful of the words we use and the actions we take because our children are watching us. Exactly. You know, And we have to work through. I like to use the word brokenness. There's a lot of brokenness in society. There's a lot of brokenness in our community for historical reasons. But you just can't go and say, 1895, this is what happened. 
you have to understand the context of why it happened and why it impacts to this day. And um, I haven't had a chance to read an article yet, but it's in the Washington Post. And, and the headline was Frederick Douglass predicted what is going on right now to this day. And I haven't been able to, I, I'm not subscribed to the Washington Post, so I've run out of my free articles. Me too. <laughs> Subscribe to other stuff, but um, but that's so true, you know. But I'm reading about him now. I actually have his biography by John Meacham, I believe. Um, I've been reading that, um, and I read so many of his speeches and words reflect what's going on today. Oh, excuse me, David Blythe. Is it David Blythe? Yeah. All right. Well, John Meacham, John Lewis. I'm reading that too. I read multiple books at the same time. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, you're right, David Blythe. So, um, so yeah, it's it's important to understand history and the con more so the context of history. It's more than just memorizing dates and and names. You have to understand understand the context because what happened in 1895 still impacts us to this day in South Carolina. And because of that, it also impacts the nation. And I don't think people really understand that. Two things about that before we go too much further in this. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Frederick Douglass just now, and I read a lot of Frederick Douglass's uh, writings also. And, and, see, and the reason why it's important not only to deal with the Frederick Douglasses and the Booker T. Washingtons and, uh, oh, to answer your question, Mr. Estevez, uh, yes, Benjamin Tillman's statue is still outside of the State House, uh, right next to where the Confederate flag used to be. I think I should have had that in since you asked me that online. But getting back to what I was about to say to you, Marilyn, it's important. You know, I had a conversation with a Jewish lady who I used to work for some time ago, and I asked her, why is it that in the uh, Jewish synagogues do they study the teachings of the Hebrew prophets, Joel, Hosea, Isaiah, and the rest of them. And she said, well, because that's our culture and religion. I said, yes, that's very true. But you study that because what they said then provides a lot of information that we can use today. Am I correct? And she agreed with that. And I said, so by that same token, the Muslims study the Quran and the teachings of the prophet Muhammad. And in the Christian church, we study the teachings of Christ and the apostles in because they have things that we should understand and learn today. And I said, so by that same token, in this era, which is largely absent of wisdom, and I have to say that because it's absolutely true, that it pays for us to go back and find the wise words of a Frederick Douglass, of a Do Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, of an Ida B. Wells, of a Dr. King, of a Malcolm X, of a Fannie Lou Hamer, of a Mary McLeod Bethune, and so on and so forth, because they said a lot of things that were wise that we can still use today. And that's why it's important that we study these things. Now, as for how all of this uh, affects us today, well, you see, part of the whole thing regarding 1895 and what happened to South Carolina, you know, I'm going to get into what happened before that to lead all that up into this a little later in this discussion. But it's important because, you see, South Carolina, because um, your homeboy, Robert Anderson, said these words in 1895 at that convention, and it goes as follows. We are told the law of injustice will roll on and on until it reaches its climax, and then a reaction is bound to come, which has already been verified in the nefarious and damnable registration laws, which you are now trying to prop up by a scheme even more diabolical. And he added, it is a living truism when you dig a pit for your brother." Dig one for yourself also. Now, here's why that's important. Because South Carolina and other states like this that were already impoverished, already struggling with mass illiteracy, chose to use its energy to keep more than half of the population of the state in poverty and ignorance so that they could remain a permanent class of cheap labor and enrich a few this is why South Carolina, Mississippi, and other such states have long been so far on the bottom of the economic and the education totem pole of the United States. Had they not done this and followed a better path that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in our talk, 
This would not be the case had they worked for the enrichment and the enlightenment of all of its citizens instead of just a few while keeping the rest down. You preaching with that one. I totally agree. I just had a lunch meeting with a Republican candidate for mayor in Georgetown this past week. I was invited to this meeting and I told her, until you work to uplift the black community in Georgetown, Georgetown will always suffer. We confuse the wealth of a few with the wealth of a community. The, it was set up that way, and it continues to be set up that way, that a few will do well. But by and large, the majority of the people are going to always be working to survive. They're going to always be struggling because that's the system that's been set up. And we perpetuate, you are correct that in this state, that we are always at the bottom of the list because we didn't make a real investment into our society, into our community. Everything was about uplifting a small percentage, the elite, rather than really helping the community. And we really need to get that understanding. And once we get that understanding, then we understand the context. Go ahead. Well, that's true, because I often talk, talk about the fact that I grew up with a number of young people who were extremely talented, but they grew up in a society that told them that they were good at all things physical and nothing mental. And that's especially true with black boys, because I was telling someone earlier this morning of how uh, it was considered so unusual when I was a boy that I was very unathletic, but very academic. And so until so aside from my dad and much later Dean Harford, you know, people would have just written me off as this strange little, you know, as uh, Amanda Gorman said, as this weird kid. And if Amanda Gorman, in case you don't remember, or is the young lady who the young lady who wrote get that marvelous poem at President Biden's inauguration. And so I often think of how many young people have grown up with ideas that could have been led to the curing of AIDS and cancer and uh, COVID. Sorts, COVID as well, and other such advancements, had their spirits been not broken by the larger society? And why were their spirits broken by the larger society? Very simple. Woodrow Wilson, before he was president in 1909, gave a speech to a convention of high school teachers in New York, 1909, where he said, and I quote, that we want two schools of education in this country, one that is necessary for a small elite to basically run the country, and another for manual labor of the masses to do the necessary chores to keep society going. So basically it was about deliberately undereducating the masses so that they could serve as a permanent course of search of cheap labor for the larger society, while you had a few that were educated to run that society and even Jefferson Davis himself, uh, when he was still senator right before he left uh, for the Confederacy in 1859, he told Congress that slavery and having this permanent black underclass, although he didn't use those words, was necessary for white unity in the South. So the poor whites were deceived into thinking that they had these advantages over black people when in reality, the wealthy ones were just giving them more privileges over the blacks to give them an illusion of equality. In other words, divide and conquer of the poor so that the rich could stay rich. And that's what racism is all about, Charlie Brown. And I have this conversation with folks all the time. And just last night was having a conversation and you talk about these poor white folks. You know, they even created societies that the whites got together, the plantation caste got together mm -hmm. with the poor whites in these societies just so they could teach them that your value is your whiteness. Correct. That's why they fight so hard for it because once you remove that artificial construct of race, what do you have left? And the concept of race is artificial because, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, throughout, even if you look through the Bible, for example, it speaks about uh, Ethiopians throughout the Bible. So much for it being a white man's religion in that case. But even with that, there's nothing in there that's being said about the Ethiopians being uh, inferior or anything like that, because that concept did not exist until about 500 years ago when the Europeans began to colonize 
different nations. Mm -hmm. They needed the cheap labor of the colonized in order to make these mother countries rich. So in order to make the people okay with that, you had pseudoscientists like uh, Carolus Linnaeus of Sweden, who said that uh, man was divided into five races with the Europeans being on top and the Africans being on the bottom and all that. So that would prop up in the average person's mind the idea that it was okay to dehumanize these people because they were of a different breed of human, so to speak. And so if you tell any person who's disfranchised that there's somebody lower on the totem pole than them, well, they're going to eat that up. And that's what led to the prep to the uh, to the constant uh, perpetuation of racism over the years. Yeah, it is. And it benefits somebody and somebody it benefits is those people at the top. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, yeah. And as Greg mentioned, it's it's the system that has been designed. Not well, necessarily that's for us to fail, but it's the, the system has been designed to keep us in a certain place. Exactly. This is why, for example, now, um, to go a little bit back uh, further than 1895, a lot of this was not taught in school for the following reason. You see, after the fall of Reconstruction, you had, uh, you had the Daughters of the Confederacy, and their whole thing was to basically whitewash the memory of con the Confederacy as opposed to being what it was, was the tragic waste of lives of poor white men who fought so that rich people could be slave owners. They basically rewrote the script as the idea that they fought for tariffs and states' rights. Yeah, but tariffs and states' rights do what, right? The idea that these poor white men, they, their fathers and grandfathers and brothers and uh, wasted their lives fighting for other people to be rich was just too, so that they could be slave. That was just too bitter for them to swallow. So therefore they came up with this lost cause myth. And uh, they had so in the schools that this type of thing would be taught as opposed to such things as the good things that came out of reconstruction and on other such things. And so we had these South Carolina history books until 1984 mm. that, um, that the, uh, Oh, Lord, her name just flew out of my head and it's going to come back to me. I know who you're talking about, the um, daughter of the Confederacy, I mean, big time. Oh, right, right. The name, right. I know who you're talking about. Right. But anyway, they had these books that were the Mary, Mary, Mary Sims Oliphant, the Mary Oliphant books mm -hmm. that had such things, for example, that the Ku Klux Klan was formed to bring order to the South when the Negroes went wild and all that. I remember reading that in my uh, South Carolina history book in 1978. And I recently found it at the Charleston County Library for proof when people ask me about these things. So they have what, it at the library. I hope they have a disclaimer in that book. Well, it's in the reference section. Well. Because it was a history book that was used in the South Carolina. So, you know, you're gonna have that in the reference section. And yeah. I'm glad they do because this can be, can be shown as proof of the kind of things that were once taught. But anyway, my point in saying all of that mm -hmm. is that the average person, again, is not a researcher or a historian. They know what they are told. And see, fortunately, I had a love of the library. And when I was at uh, middle school, I read things like the Negro, at the, a pictorial history of the Negro in America by Langston Hughes. And I witnessed the Negro in um, American history and things like that. That's what kind of, that's, those were the type of things that sort of was my antidote to the nonsense that I was being taught in the classroom. So while I didn't get it in the classroom proper, I still got it out of school, but in the library. But if you're a child who doesn't grow up in a home that is filled with books and reading, you're not gonna go to any of that. So it's necessary that those of us who know these things take this out to the masses of people so they can know better and do better. And we have these type of conversations that you and I are having, because mm -hmm. if they don't read, at least they'll listen. Exactly. You get somebody and you can repeat this. So y'all come back to the show and, and share it. <laughs> well, but that's exactly that, what I'm going to do when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is why I bring folks on. You know, I recently had Dr. Eric Crawford on mm -hmm. who his book just got spirituals, the origins of American music, basically. Mm -hmm. And we got into you can hear 
we because some of the songs are out in the public domain on YouTube. Mm -hmm. So I was able to play some of them and you can hear blues. You can hear bluegrass. You can hear jazz. And what the connection, the historical connection is Louisiana. It's not Gala per se of we're on the Eastern coast, but it's the same mix, a Creole language, a, a whole culture was created from enslaved Africans. They just happen to be Louisiana, English and French, where Gala is English and Spanish, but it's the same origins. It's an ever, and I tell people now, we are an evolutionary community. That's very true. But and, there's one, but there's one thing I want, I'm sorry, go ahead. That, I didn't mean to talk about you, I'm sorry. Well, I want to say this quickly, then you can say, the sure. reason why we're an evolutionary community culture is not because of physical, it's because of mental. And you touched on that a little bit when you were saying, you know, we, we were taught in school about the mind, about the physical, right? And it is, we're evolutionary because we were, our ancestors were enslaved and brought here because their, their knowledge of how to control the water and manage the land that grew the rice. And I, I say that now because of my evolution and learning more about my culture, who I am and the community at large, because when you just see pictures of the enslaved in these rice fields, you're just thinking, oh, they just picking the rice. No. They knew how to control the water and manage the land to grow the rice. You had to know it. The Europeans didn't know anything about it. So that speaks to mental strength. They weren't, yes, they had that physical strength to survive alligator snakes, the hard work, but they were enslaved because of their knowledge. And that's evolutionary because we took what we did not have and made a whole new culture and community. We took languages and created a whole new language. We took our foods from the motherland and created a whole new way of cooking. You know, and the way we spare it was spiritual. We could trace it to West African origins, but we evolved into a whole new community. And that speaks of mental strength. That's all well, I have to say. <laughs> Well, all of that is true, but uh, there's something I have to add to all of this that is extremely important to put it in Go ahead. Is that, you know, during slavery, it was not a case where the people were 100% illiterate. You had people such as uh, Reverend Daniel, Reverend Daniel uh, Alexander Payne, who was forced to leave Charleston after he had a school for free and enslaved children. He was, uh, he went to Wilberforce, Ohio, excuse me, went to, Xenia, Ohio, where he started Wilberforce University, first black college in America that was run by black people. OK, so after the fall of slavery and the end of the Confederacy, you had the Reconstruction era where they tried to reform the South with the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments that dealt with issues such as the end of slavery, the citizenship of black people and voting rights. Most people do not know that from eight, January to April 1868, where the federal courthouse is today over on Meeting Street, 76 blacks and 48 whites gathered to rewrite the state's constitution. And they passed such laws as, as the uh, voting rights for every male person. In fact, William J. Whipper even wanted women in on that, but that was too radical for them in 1868. They uh, had state hospitals and mental institutions and anti-discrimination laws. But very significantly, the great Robert Smalls, uh, shown here, and this is the cover of my book, uh, Voices of Black South Carolina, that talks about a lot of this. On, December, on January the 23rd, 1868, he passed a law that said, resolved all children between the ages of seven and 14 must attend public school at least six months a year under penalty of non-compliance. That was the first public school law in South Carolina. And it, was, and it was basically the brainchild of the great Robert Smalls. Now, how do you know that I'm not pulling this out of thin air? Simple. At the Charleston County Library, South Carolina Room Archives, and at the State Archives in Columbia, they have the minutes to the 1868 Constitutional Convention, all for the date of January the 23rd, 1868, that had that information. Okay? So you had two black lieutenant governors during that period. You had uh, Alonzo Jacob Ranzier, who served from 1870 to 1872. He was followed by Richard Howell Gleaves, who served from 1872 to 1877, okay? 
And then, really interesting, that because of this legislature, you had the University of South Carolina, our alma mater, from 1873 to 1877. It was the first and only integrated school anywhere in the South. And you had the first Black professor there, Professor Richard T. Greener, whose statue is now in front of the Thompson Library at the University of South Carolina. In the words of the rapper KRS-One, you, if you know this fact, they can't laugh at you, okay? And how did I find out about the latter? Before that statue was there, there was a book about the history of the University of South Carolina that I read that same library where his statue is now almost 30 years later. So it was against these things, this type of backdrop, that in Pulaski, Tennessee, on December the 24th, 1865, that six Confederate veterans gathered to form the Resistance Army of Reconstruction. They named themselves after the Greek word for circle, which is kuklos, and the Scottish word for family, which is clan. And that's how the Ku Klux Klan started. But what a lot of people don't know is that there was a black Charlestonian lawyer named Robert Brown Elliott who testified in Congress against the Ku Klux Klan's brutality in South Carolina. And they had trials in Spartanburg, Rock Hill, and Columbia there where the testimony was so disgusting that President Ulysses S. Grant passed the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 that made, out, that made domestic terrorism officially illegal. And every act of domestic terrorism since then, including the Klansmen who killed Viola Uzo, the idiots who revolted against the Capitol on January 6th, all of that fell under the Ku Klux Klan Act. And that was due to Robert Smalls, this African-American lawyer who practiced on 91 Broad Street in Charleston back in 1868. So with all that happening, the, the white South revolted and people like Benjamin Tillman led the, uh, the Hamburg massacre in 1876. And all these massacres led the federal government to say, that's it, we can't reform these people. They passed the Tillman Hayes Compromise that ended reconstruction in the South. And that is when the former Confederates took over and led the Tillman rise and eventually the end of uh, reconstruction with the 1895 constitution. But both this book, Voices of Black South Carolina, and in greater detail, my upcoming uh, Call Us Aliens show that that did not happen without a fight. And what we learned from a lot of those guys in that process could help us today. And there you have it. You know, and speaking of that time when they basically said we can't reform, that's the term you used. But in the Frederick Douglass book I'm reading, they tell you the deal that was cut behind doors with Benjamin T. Harrison to make him president. Mm-hmm. Basically, they gave up on the South and walked Rutherford away. Hayes. Was it Rutherford Hayes? Yeah. Rutherford I know Hayes. it was H. Yeah. And um, they basically gave up on the South and walked right. away. They, they opened the door to it and they knew what they were doing. Exactly. You know, so this has always been a national problem. We think yeah. about the South has segregation, races. This whole nation, it's a national problem because when it came down to it, just to be the this is why I do love Reverend William Barber II, because he understands that it's a moral question. Yes. You know, I mean, you really have to look at yourself in the mirror and, and make a moral decision on what side of history will you be on. And they constantly in this country, unfortunately, they have not come down on the right side of history. And we forget about the backdoor deals because those aren't necessarily put in the newspaper. Well, that's why they're backdoor deals. They're not going to get in the newspaper, which are the front line of history. You know, agree with them or not, newspapers usually were the, f the first line of history, recorded history. Then you do research and you study and you flesh it out through books, academic research, etc. cetera. And it, those backdoor deals don't get into newspapers. But those backdoor deals, we deal with the consequences to this day. And their ripple effects from those deals that were made. Well, not only that, but you see, you had the same problem then that you do now in that instead of being the leader, the leaders of that time, as well as now being the leaders and telling people things that what Trump was preaching is nonsense and that the uh, this anti-vaccine stuff is foolishness, et cetera, and so forth. They are being followers instead of leaders. They are following their crowds, like the leaders of back then Follow their crowd's desire to have somebody on the bottom of the totem pole by promoting Jim Crow instead of doing what they knew in their heart was right. They settled for a political expediency to ride the wave of popularity to stay in office. Today, you have politicians that know good and well that 
vaccinations work and that uh, they should that they should encourage people to wear masks and all that. But because of their desire for power and popularity, they are following the crowd and all that. And that always leads to one thing, which is disaster. And this is why in 1896, the great uh, philosopher Jorge Santillana said around the same time that the Jim Crow laws were happening in South Carolina elsewhere, that those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And since so many people don't know history, we are seeing the repeating of that right now. And that's why historians are so important, because while we cannot predict what's going to happen, we know about the past or we study the past enough so we can give you a general idea of what path not to take. You may not be able to predict what can happen, but you could certainly warn about or exactly. educate about what could happen. Exactly, exactly. And and I say it because I don't claim myself a mantle of history of a historian. I just claim the mantle of I appreciate history and I study. Um, that if we don't get our act together, if we don't make some bold decisions as elected officials, people don't realize how close we are to civil war. And every time they put a deadline on something, for example, August 13th, Trump is supposed to be president again. You got people out there who really believe that, who have access to guns, who may not be official militia, but in their head, they militia. And in, you know, on August 14th, it very, it may be very real that people are going to get killed because they're going to be people who realize Trump ain't going to be president. Oh, he's not president. We are a violent country and we pacify violence. We have states like South Carolina just passed open carry law. And they brought back the electric chair and uh, the firing squad. Too. That's violence. That it's not physical violence yet because we ain't electrocute somebody yet. But you, you're perpetuating violence. And it takes just one person who doesn't have emotional mental maturity if you will to pull a trigger because they are just angry and it's going to escalate it has happened time and time again in history so you can't predict it the future but you can certainly lay out the possibilities and this is once again why we have to have these kind of conversations so people have knowledge and can make wise you've already said that <laughs> Well, first of all, Make let me say this about, decisions because wisdom is lacking. Exactly. Because now, as far as August the 13th, let me just say this right now to anybody who believes that. Read the Constitution of the United States. Article 20 passed in passed around the early 1930s said that the date of the inauguration of the president is January the 20th, period. That is the date. OK, so there is no getting around that. But that just goes to shows the dangerous of what ignorance, that's what I said, ignorance, not knowing of the own laws of the country will do to you. And when you just listen to people without doing background research, this is the kind of nonsense and dangerous folly that can result. And you see, that's the kind of stuff that you also have to consider this, okay? Throughout history, Babylon rose, Babylon fell. Egypt rose, Egypt fell, Greece rose, Greece fell, Rome rose, Rome fell, and hey, what is stopping next, the next great empire, which is us, if you do not get your act together? Um, so it's shown that all those empires that you talked about rising and falling about every 400 to 500 years on average, mm -hmm. and um, my homeboy, Dr. Sam Livingston from Morehouse, I brought him on also, and he was talking about 1526 in Georgetown, where the Spanish brought enslaved the first, people, the first, the first. and it Not came to Georgetown, 1526, South Carolina, but had you, Guadalupe in Georgetown. that's right, but just as you make the connections to past events in history. He made the connection too because in Africa an empire fell. The Songhai Empire. Yes. That opened up the, the slave that trade. That is correct. That's so and people, correct. you have to realize, you know, it, it wasn't just you know, things happened that allowed colonization. Things have Empires rise and fall. That's right. And then it got us to 1526. So now mm -hmm. 1526 
Let's add 400 was 1926. 500 is 2026. We are in 2021, folks. That's right. And I really think this has been a slow collapse because the elite of this country have bamboozled us. And what do I mean by that? Um, newspapers and media, TV, used to have local ownership. Then they passed the law under Reagan. They ended that. Now you have big corporations. It is to their financial benefit to bamboozle people. So you actually have corporations controlling the local messages. And people, even if you're not reading or watching news, what you are hearing is very slanted. And you have to have critical thinking skills to work your way through that. This isn't just something that happened under Trump. And I see that in the media also. They try to make a oh, Trump, Trump, Trumpism. If you just remove the Trumpers, we'll go back. No, this has been coming on for decades. It's a slow tidal wave of people not protecting the minorities in this country, removing protections under the law or making laws to benefit corporations. Citizens United literally uplifted corporations to the human status. That plays a part in this. And I'm simplifying the laws, but that's basically what it did. But they might have made 500 paper pages in a law, but that's also to confuse you too, because who's going to read 500 pages? You've 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 ended laws that get lobbyists out of creating laws. You have organizations such as ALEC that literally are creating laws and buying off elected officials and giving them the law. And so you go you go past that law. You know, so so the corruption is so corroded. The infrastructure of our country is corroded, not only in the bridges and the roads, our moral compass is corroded. Well, and it takes a lot to stand up to that. So now let's bring it back to this book that you're getting ready to release, release the Six Brave Brothers. Put that in context of today that you have to be brave to have the knowledge and to stand up to this. Well, that's very true because you see, they called out the fact that these leaders like Tillman were basically exploiting the fears of the poor whites and were not then we're not actually doing anything to enrich them with us, but feeding into their egos, and they knew better. And as a matter of fact, it's a little known fact too that uh, they were that these men were so strong in their arguments that they were two white state representatives, T. E. Dudley of Marlboro and John Halston Reed from Georgetown, who actually went along with the six black representatives when they were trying to uh, get trying to stop the plan of Tillman, but you see, it was those individuals versus 116 uh, followers of Benjamin Tillman in the state legislature who basically led to the defeat of this. But a lot of but with people who have shown this uh, manuscript too, and even the people who have read uh, this book, which contains a shorter version of that, uh, Truth, uh, Voices of Black South Carolina, they see how a lot of what these men said then in defense of what they were trying to do, these that they, this could, a lot of this could be written today. Because again, this type of history was buried in old newspapers and uh, other things that the average person does not read. So I also make a call for a lot of my fellow historians out there to sometimes you have to get out of the ivory tower and take what you know to the masses of people. Why is this important? Because right now you have false historians and exploiters all over YouTube, people saying ridiculous things like, uh, Harriet Tubman was a fictional character and that Nat Turner didn't exist. And Oh, yeah. Oh, I haven't heard that for real. That's why I'm looking shocked. A lot of these young people who would not be known to the intelligentsia because they're aimed at the type of uneducated people who get their information out of barber shops and people who look at all this nonsense about the Illuminati or the Illuminati, as I call it, things <laughs> like that, that a lot of scholars consider beneath them. But you have to get down to where the people are and speak to them in the language that the people understand to prevent this kind of thing from happening out there. And so I'd like to think that I'm doing my part in that process. I think you are. And we need folks like you uh, who are doing 
this education piece. We really do. Who will take the time to research? Well, even you just and meet people where they are and share the information. Well, that's the key thing: meeting them where they are. Because even with critical race theory, uh -huh, the you know, the part of the problem with that was that if you read the dictionary definition of it, it was intended for law school students. And it was written in language that was so dense that the average person couldn't understand it. So that gave the opposition the opportunity to frame it falsely as anti-white and anti-American teaching. And instead of the intelligentsia saying, no, 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 that's not what it means at all. They were so caught up in their own world that this allowed the opposition to frame it in their own way and cause mass confusion around the land. Now, now, I now agree. I read, go ahead, Damon. I'll, I'll go ahead. Finish. Now, when I read the definition of critical race theory, it took me a while to figure out that what they were saying was that it was a means of examining American history through the critical lens of race. And I'm like, well, that's all you had to say. But again, it was causing so much uh, academies that the average person just isn't going to get that. So that's why I say a lot of in, a lot of the intelligentsia you need to get down to where the people are in a language that they could understand so you can equip them to fight this kind of nonsense. I'm going to dispute what you're saying a little bit. And the reason I am is because in marketing, we have certain audience and we know that. Mm -hmm. I don't think the intelligentsia, as you described on those academics, they weren't thinking of a universal audience. I know. They were thinking of they were caught flat-footed. That's right? what I'm saying. But I can't necessarily blame them because their audience is other, like you say, law school, other academics. Critical race theory has been around 20 years. Mm -hmm. They never thought we we're going to go to the mass. Masses, they were teaching to their market, who they were going to teach to. But you have people who did not have the best interests of academia or the masses in heart, they just have their interests in how do we gain control? And they knew enough, were clever enough to once again go get a boogeyman because that's what they do. Well, I'm not disagreeing. That's why with you had the tea party and everything. I, I, I think what I have is it comes across that you're blaming the acad the people who created critical race theory. No, 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 no. Listen, listen. Where, right. where it should be the people who took it and made it the boogeyman. No, that's not what I said. That's not what I Go said. Ahead. What I said was that they should have done a better job in defending what they were doing. There you go. The, that is there what I go. said. Okay. I didn't, that, that, that. I didn't hear it. But you know, let's be honest. So now I'm going to, I, I do. That's, that's what I needed to hear. Defending. That's what I was saying. But when you're caught in your ivory tower, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you don't think about it. And I'm not using that as an excuse. This is why I think there needs to be better communication marketing. That's what I'm saying. Um, between, you know, down, you know, yeah. And, you know, and I say that because uh, I live with some, you know, I grew up with academia, academia. Mm -hmm. So I kind of know that, that kind of ivory tower thing, you know, and being family, they're down to earth, but the kind of thing out of the box has in, I need to be down to earth to, to to the masses. It's not necessarily in their DNA, so that means we need to have better communication between uh, communicators. I'll give it, and I'll, I'll give you an example, totally from a different uh, field. That I I'm a writer. My degrees in journalism, and journalism actually taught me to write. Mm -hmm. I write different ways and I worked for Bell South for a few years as a technical writer. The man who developed the computer program, brilliant, brilliant, could not teach it. He knew it, but could not teach it. They hired me to learn from him and write and teach it because he just was not capable. Uh, he just wasn't capable. He his mind was on a different plane. Knew what he was talking about. New computers. I didn't read. I I learned from him, obviously. But I have the ability. My gift was to take what he knew in his head and write it to share with the masses to educate the people. And that's you know? what we need. And that's what the critical race theory 
it's it's that's what they ran into in the academic sense. exactly yeah so that's i just want to make sure we all on the same page and people really truly understand that with with that said damon there are more books i think that are written that are really educating the masses and i don't know if these people who are against critical race theory are getting that but when i read books such as the great migration by isabel wilkerson it's academic, but it's written in a way. I read that book in like two days and engaged me. You know, um, she, her other book, Cast, that was harder to read, not because of the academic, the it was so emotional to me. It's like the first, I went to see the movie Hidden Figures twice because the first time I cried throughout the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> to go back and see it again to actually see the movie and we touched on this at the beginning of this show with history even my family where we read a lot educated studied you know living history i didn't know about the hidden figures so when i went to the movies and i saw black women who were mathematicians scientists etc who impacted nasa in history, I cried through the entire movie. Had to go back again to see it to really understand what happened in the movie. Um, I think that's happening more and more with the People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn. Those type of books that just regular folks can go pick up and read and now start getting educated. The critical race theory, the people who are manipulating critical race theory understand this. And they know better. I mean, because we understand that this is about manipulation. Of course they know. They know better, but mm -hmm. their greed and want of power is what they, they know exactly what they're doing, but yeah. they're driven by greed and power. Right. So it's about we're going to manipulate the emotions of ignorant people who we've made ignorant because for the past 50 years, we've been attacking the public school system. We've been attacking government and making government the enemy rather than living by the words by President Abraham Lincoln, you know, government for the people, by the people and of the people. We are the government people. The government reflects who we are. You know, so when people are attacking the government, they're attacking us, the people. So we are rapidly coming to the point where even the people who are manipulating emotions to turn people against each other, eventually the people that they are manipulating are going to turn against them too. That's just human nature. So we are in very dangerous times. It's, we're in very dangerous times. Because even the manipulators will soon lose control of those they manipulate. And then who else? Who, where do you turn then? You turn and you attack those who have been othered. When you have a lack, you know, sense of, you lose that sense of control, even if it was an illusion to begin with, you're not going to attack what you were familiar and love. And if the, but the one thing that they love is their whiteness, you're going to attack the black and brown, red, yellow, black and white based on the song. That's why we are living in very dangerous times. Well, if history is any indication, I mean, you're going to see a lot of that type of thing across the board, really, because um, it's because, you know, we saw this in the late 60s when you had that massive internal violence that is often not talked about by people today for a very good reason, because it's just too unpleasant and embarrassing. But, you know, we escaped an internal Holocaust about uh, 30 and 40 years, I'm excuse me, 40 and 50 years ago that a lot of people are completely clueless about, you know, what you deal with things like the weathermen and all, and uh, Kent State and all these type of things that were happening at that time. A lot of that, you know, a lot of what's happening today pales greatly in comparison to that. Because when I hear people say, well, this country's never been this divided. Well, you ever heard of the Civil War? You ever heard of the late <laughs> No. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, it is yeah. no see, yeah. if you right, don't know that. This is not that, our country. Right. Exactly. But see, don't this, know. If you don't yeah, know it that. It is our country. country. And that's yeah. why knowing all this, this stuff helps put things in perspective. And this is why 
I do YouTube videos on my channel, The American Storyteller, and write the kind of books I write because I figure the academics can take care of themselves. I'm worried about the people, the average Joe who does not grow up in homes with books or that type of thing. So where I can, if you don't read, I can reach you through my social media page or my uh, YouTube channel. In fact, Dr. Henry Louis Gates, uh, but, but who's uh, one of my mentors and I'm proud to call him a friend. He recently did this. He's recently doing this series now called not just um, the what, Finding Your Roots, but he has this new series called Black History in Two Minutes, where he takes a subject and explains it within two minutes where you get the basic idea of it. But he also gives you source. So if you want to learn more, you can learn more. That is necessary because so many people are growing up without this. It needs to be put in a way that they can understand. Very true. I totally agree with you on that. And um, Damon, this is a fascinating conversation. <laughs> and we've had a good calm comments and everything. And I said one hour. I thought we would go. But you know, when you and I get together, we get into these conversations. And I love it. Yes, this is the type of stuff I love mm -hmm. um, um, to do. But we're going to have to wrap up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, because we're coming to the end of the show but i do have your facebook page up so y'all he is on facebook please go to facebook and so when he makes the announcement about his most recent book that's coming up that is tentatively called call, call us aliens and i told you university of south carolina press university of south carolina press i'm sure he's going to put it on his facebook page and that means we're going to put it on the gotta get you chamber page but also he's on Amazon. I have this posted here. You could just Google him, Amazon. It'll come back, come up or go to Amazon.com and do a search for Damon L. Fordham and he will come up. But this is the group, the Amazon page and go order his books. He already has some other books um, up and, and, you know, just get started. And, and briefly, I have a YouTube channel called The American Storyteller. Easy to remember, okay? Oh, I forgot about that one. You are right. I am sorry I forgot about that one. All right. The American Storyteller on YouTube. So he is all over and has Damon is very good. He teaches, you know, he's meeting the people where they are and giving um, us good knowledge. And um, Damon, I love this. And um, thank you for coming on. You know, I'm going to bring you back, right? Oh, of course. You're very welcome. Yeah, and we're not going to do it until wait until the next book that you write. After this book comes out, I do want you to come back and let's talk about the book. Right, and, and we'll I'm going to also this post this video book. on my page too, so people can please see. Please do, okay? please do, and um, yeah, I love this and all. And y'all, if people wants us to keep going, but we can't keep going. <laughs> I love that you said that, Pilar. She's she's, she's from Georgetown, Damon. Um, but uh, we gotta, you know, we gotta keep it short. And everything. And I will speak in Georgetown too. By the way, we're working on that. Really? Yeah, Steve Williams and I. Yeah. Oh, you know, I gotta talk to Steve. Did, did Steve tell you us tell you about our project that we did together? Uh, no, but I know about his new book. Oh, yeah, his book too, Gully Roots Tour Company. We start our Black History Guided Tour here in Georgetown. Steve and I are doing it together. Right. Yeah. So when you guys do the show, I need to bring you guys back on together then. When y'all before the show. Okay. And then Steve, I need to bring him on because of his book also. Um, but yeah, we are um um working on that together also. So when you come to Georgetown, we're gonna do the tour for you. Okay. We'll do it complimentary since I know you. <laughs> Then Damon, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. Always enjoy you. You always educate me and correct me when I get my names and stuff mixed up. But as I said, I'm not the historian. I'm just a reader and learn a little bit and everything. But hey, I'm adding your books to my library as we speak. So it's all good. Thank you, Damon. Appreciate it. And um, fellow Gamecock, go Cox. And um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a girl won the gold. Yeah, Aja and Don Staley. So we're very happy. The game cocks. We we did we're doing good in the Olympics. Very good. All right, Damon. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And I'll be seeing you later. You're welcome. Take care. Right, thank you. 
And folks, wonderful show today with Damon L. Fordham. i just so excited to have him on. Y'all go to Amazon, look up his books. And his new book is tentatively called Call Us Aliens. And um, if that changes, we'll let you know. But go to his Facebook page, like him, follow him so you can stay up to date. This is how you learn history. Um, you know, local history, man, this thing impacts us nationally and globally. That's why it's so important that you know history and the context of history. Our next show is also an author. Um, it's a children's book. Grandma, I Got This by Tara Hill starts this coming Wednesday at four o'clock. She's going to be talking about her illustrated children's book, Grandma, I Got This. You know, I always focus on local authors and um Love to have her on, so looking forward to that, to talk about her book. And before the end of the year, I've got some big news announcement from the Gullah Geechee Chamber Foundation, Foundation supporting our local authors. And you too, we want y'all to support those local authors too, and also to help our children and adults read. So that's going to be coming up soon also. Y'all, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your time and presence, and of course, Look forward to seeing everybody this Wednesday. Once again, thanks to Damon Fordham and everybody have a good evening.